What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel and to the next episode of the Overwatch League off-season recap. We're six episodes into this thing and we're still going strong, so thank you all so much for the incredible support. Today's episode has some juicy developments, so let's dive straight into the video by starting off with the signings. And there's no better team to start off with than the Gladiators, who made some major improvements to their support line by acquiring both Shu and Moth at a free agency. I mean, wow. Getting Moth to lead the shock is crazy enough on its own, but then you get Shu as a bonus. The Gladiators management is working some serious magic right now. These are two high value pickups that will instantly make this team a lot better. Moth is still arguably the league's best main support, so that right there is going to make this team a whole lot better because he's a major upgrade over Big Goose. But now you add in Shu, who really doesn't get the respect he deserves at times. I genuinely do believe he was arguably the second best flex support in APAC last year. Shu has some insane mechanics, and he's someone who could still theoretically improve. He has experience working within a mixed roster as well, so he should be a good fit right from the start, so long as he synergizes well with his teammates. If him and Moth play as well as we all know they can, then Big Goose and Chaz will be nothing but a distant memory. I really am impressed with the moves made by the Gladiators so far. First they get a promising player in Muse, then they sign Shu and Moth who have the potential to become the best support line in the Overwatch League right from day one. The Gladiators are looking insanely stacked on paper. A projected starting lineup of Muse, Space, Bird Ring, Kevster, Moth, and Shu sounds deadly. If the Gladiators disappoint, I would be very surprised. This is a potential super team in the making. Speaking of Moth and his departure from the Shock while we're still on that topic, it would seem that the Shock have already found their replacement. Yesterday in a trade with the Paris Eternal, the Shock acquired FD God. What a powerful move by the Shock. You lose one top tier Western main support just to get another. I can't really think of a better replacement to be honest. It keeps that culture of a Western team going and FD God still has untapped potential. As good as he was in his rookie season, I still don't think he's hit a ceiling. And what better person to help him get there than Krusty. FD God is in amazing hands. It might be a little awkward at first for him being on a team where he doesn't really know anybody, but I get the feeling he's going to fit in just fine. He has the experience working with Korean players already, and we've seen him be the only English-speaking player in a starting lineup before, just as Moth did. Paris are going full-on budget mode, so FD God was ripe for the taking. If you wanted the same formula at main support, this is as close as you're possibly going to get. While FD God isn't quite as good as Moth, it's really not a bad compensation piece at all, and there really isn't that much of a skill gap, if any. Just when I begin to wonder who the Shock might get as their new main support, they make a real power play. Well played, Shock. Well played. Next up, we have the Dallas Fuel making yet another move during their busy offseason with the acquisition of Jexe. Hey, would you look at that? Another former Element Mystic player on Dallas. What a surprise! Whoever could have seen that one coming? But for real, it's not a bad pickup at all. Despite playing on a terrible Houston team, Jexay still did have his moments in Season 3. This especially goes for the beginning of the season when his Lucio felt like a true difference maker. I will say though, I kind of feel like his quality of play dropped off slightly as the season progressed. However, it never really got to the point where I thought of him as unreliable, and you'd have to imagine that it was very unmotivating to play for a struggling team that never really made any significant improvements. I'm sure being in that always losable mentality took its toll on his gameplay at least a little bit, but you know, he was definitely still a B-tier support at worst, and that gives me hope that he's going to play much better under Dallas. He's got access to better coaching, and he's on a team that's hungry to win. I definitely do believe he'll find newfound confidence quickly. Jexay still gets to be with his buddy Repel, which is really cool, but him and Fielder sounds pretty nice as well. That's a support lineup that's going to get the job done. Oh, and in case you were wondering, Jexay is another person who will take part in the OG Element Mystic reunion. Him, Repel, Fearless, and Sparkle all played together under Coach Rush when Element Mystic was first formed back in August of 2017. It might take a little bit of time to rekindle it, but there's a lot of synergy already going for this team, which gives me a lot more confidence that Dallas will not disappoint this year. Their projected rotations looking pretty clean. Fearless and Hanbin could be among the elite tank lines, Jexe, Fielder, and Rappel could cover pretty much everything you'd ever need, then Sparkle and Doha bring you explosiveness at DPS. The only glaring weakness I notice here is Hitscan. If they get an elite sniper of some kind, then Dallas are in fantastic shape. Next up is the Guangzhou Charge, who signed Kareev as their new flex support to replace Shu. So from a pure talent perspective, this could be seen as a downgrade. It's fair to say that Shu was a better player than Kareev last year, and I would tend to agree with that. 
She was higher potential, but just because it's a downgrade, it doesn't really mean it's a terrible signing or anything. Kareev is a talented player too, and he still showcased some very good performances on a bad team last year. In all likelihood, the Charge will build a noticeably better team than that 2020 Defiant team did. With that in mind, Kareev is going to have much better support around him. I'm very, very intrigued to see how he performs under a better head coach. Kareev has a chance to be noticeably better than last year simply because of the change of scenery. One other factor we should keep in mind is that Kareev might not have to worry about his communication as much. Despite playing on English-speaking teams for three years, he still does have trouble with his English at times, but now he's probably going to be speaking a bit more Korean, you'd have to imagine. There might be some English incorporated here and there because the Charge definitely do intend to keep Chinese players around, but it's not going to be how it was on the Valiant or Defiant. Kareev has a chance to thrive under this new system. Charge fans should be happy that they settled on a good replacement, even if he's not quite as good as Shu. But wait, Charge fans, there's even more. The Charge completed their new support line by signing Mandu, formerly of the NYXL. Now, there's a chance this could be a downgrade compared to what Chara did last year, but there's no way of saying for sure because we saw so little of Mandu in Season 3. Mandu is still a wild card. There's so much untapped potential that has yet to come to the surface. He's a very aggressive player, and that might play well with the style of Kareev. If Mandu is the one and only main support the Charge have on the team this year, this is going to be a risky play, but it also has a lot of upside to it. Mandu could develop into a very solid player, and Arachne might pull a page out of Krusty's book here. It's important to note that Mandu is reunited with his former teammate Krong as well. Mandu has a lot of good resources going for himself on the charge. If there was ever a time for him to realize his potential, this would be it. The stars might be aligning here, and I'm so happy that the charge gave him a shot. He'll bring a new style that they never really had under Chara. The new charge support line might not be too bad, but guess what? There's more. The Charge finished off their big week by picking up the Chinese Contenders DPS prospect out of Billy Billy Gaming, Mai K. Lee, formerly known as just K. Lee. His team recently finished in third place in Season 2 of Chinese Contenders. He plays hitscan, so he's looking like a potential solution for Happy. After looking over a bit of his recent gameplay, I was pretty impressed. As someone who may be a bit unknown to the casual fan, he might surprise some people next year. Under a coach out of the shock system, he might grow into a special player. The charge appear to be set on having a partial Chinese roster still, and right now their projected starting lineup would be two Chinese players and four Korean. Could that make communication a little difficult? Perhaps, but surely the charge are nowhere near close to being done, so the big picture might change and become a bit less worrisome as the offseason continues. Regardless, it's not a bad pickup. Let's see what this guy can do. Next up, to the surprise of absolutely no one, the Shanghai Dragons went through with a trade with the Florida Mayhem for fate. I talked about it a little bit in last week's episode, but this made way too much sense for it to not come true. Moon gets rid of Fearless to pick up one of his all-time favorite players to work with. It's a match made in heaven. These two have worked together for many years, and fate is going to fit his system no doubt because of it. Fearless is definitely a tier above fate, so you probably won't see as many hard carry plays, but he could still put in the work nonetheless. After all, he tends to play out his best when Coach Moon is around. But what about the Florida Mayhem? What is their plan of attack? Most of the big name rookie main tanks have already been signed and there's only a few good veterans left on the market. If they were willing to trade away fate so easily, then that tells me they already have somebody in mind. I could be wrong here, but try and remember that they weren't so willing to give up fate just one year prior. Trust in your management, Florida fans. I think you're going to be okay. Moving on to some Boston Uprising news, they broke their silence since the beginning of the offseason with the addition of I'm 37 to their roster. The Path to Pro speedrunner is making his return to the Overwatch League after spending a year grinding in contenders. Boston fans should feel pretty excited. He improved and honed his skills a ton since we saw him play for Toronto. His hits game prowess is as good as ever, and he was even part of the top Korean contenders team, WGS Phoenix. He's going to bring an explosive element to a DPS line that was lacking, and let's not forget that his coach comes from the same place as he does. It's honestly the best case scenario for I'm 37. He's under the same coach who he already knows he can be successful under, and he speaks very good English, so being part of a mixed roster won't be a problem. Boston have made some very nice moves so far this offseason. If they keep this up, they might seriously be a respectable team in the future. Another bit of Boston Uprising roster news is Axiom mutually parting ways with the team. It's a bit sad to see Axiom out of Boston after seeing him play so little for them. While it's clear that he really did not enjoy his time there, he might have been a good player for them if the circumstances were better. He could have been a good main tank option for them. He has upside to him. Maybe one day he's going to get another chance to prove himself. He might go on the same path as I'm 37 where he takes some time to grind in tier 2, then comes back stronger than ever. 
The next big move on the agenda comes from the Atlanta Reign, who signed the flex DPS player Pelican out of O2 Blast. Pelican was one of the most sought-after DPS prospects, so congrats to Atlanta for winning the bidding war. Scouts and fans alike were very excited for this guy to turn 18. Pelican has insanely high potential. Not only is he fantastic with his mechanics, but he's got a very versatile hero pool, showing the ability to play both projectile and some hitscan heroes at a very high level. This is a pretty good scenario if you're the Atlanta Reign. Erster was not a reliable option for various reasons last year, so now they get somebody who could be even better. Picking up Pelican is a strong start to Atlanta's offseason for sure. But I have a question. How is it that Atlanta always wins the bidding war for these big-name rookie DPS players? Last year it was Edison and Sharp, and now it's Pelican. It's honestly kind of unfair if you ask me. I just hope that Atlanta don't waste this guy's career. I pray that they get it together so they can avoid more internal issues and a mediocre season. How about we shift over to the Washington Justice picking up Jerry now? I've heard some surprisingly negative opinions on this acquisition. I've seen a lot of people say it was a mistake to bring him in over Stitch, but I wholeheartedly disagree. Yeah, Stitch showed a lot of promise during the playoffs, but that's pretty much it. He showed flashes during the regular season, but a lot of the time he appeared rather ineffective on the Justice. Outside of his Ash, he was, well, kind of average. I think that's pretty fair to say. Jerry genuinely may be more useful than Stitch from the long-term point of view. I know it's a big meme, but Jerry really isn't that bad. He's not a top-tier player or anything like that, but he did have his moments on Boston on a variety of hitscan heroes. Remember, Jerry is no slouch on the Ash either, and I would say his Widow is definitely better. Stitch has been playing this game for a long time, and we kind of know what his peak looks like at this point. Meanwhile, Jerry's ceiling is yet to be established. Playing for a bad team with bad coaching is going to hold a player back. Now Jerry has access to some very well-respected coaches on the Justice, and with a better overall team supporting him, Jerry might thrive. He might develop into someone who makes big plays as a part of the rotation. What people have to realize is that Jerry is not being brought in as this highly sought-after prize who is getting a ton of money thrown at him. In all likelihood, Jerry is just a budget pickup. I would say at best he was probably slightly above average on Boston, and that's not going to give you the big bucks. This is a low-risk, high-reward signing for the Justice. They get somebody who is arguably pretty inexpensive, you'd have to imagine, who could develop into a big-time playmaker. And let's not forget that this gives Washington a pretty complete DPS rotation. You have Tubo for projectile and Sombra purposes, Decay on his carry heroes, and Jerry for double hit scan metas. It's perfect. Decay on the Tracer with Jerry on maybe like the Ash or the Widow sounds like it could be pretty good. Don't sleep on Jerry, Justice fans. He might just surprise you. Now we have to get into some departures. The big one to start off with is the Philadelphia Fusion. I apologize in advance, Philly fans, because this might be painful for some of you, but the Fusion have made the decision to move on from Sato, Fury, and Ivy. Three players who were at the top of their respective positions in 2020, so these are some tough losses to say the least. I've already gone over this before, but Sato did have a better season than Mono, so this could end up being a slight downgrade unless a more passive style proves to benefit Philly better. But you never know, I suppose. Maybe Mono might be able to step up and thrive under a new system. Philly could have a solid plan in the works, so getting rid of Sato for Mono might not be the end of the world. And I share a similar mindset with Ivy leaving. Yeah, I get it. Losing him really sucks. He was easily a top-tier flex DPS, but they have a chance to get somebody who is at his level still. Rascal is a free agent, and picking him up is starting to make more and more sense. The Fusion need a flex DPS, and they just so happen to have a former coach that Rascal played under on the shock. If the Fusion managed to make this happen, then it'll be okay, because Rascal is world class. I know Fusion fans are going to need time to recover from the loss of Ivy, but I think they'll learn to be happy again so long as the Fusion come through with somebody like Rascal, or maybe Liberal, or some other high-potential rookie prospect. If they do not get a suitable replacement, though, then we'll start talking about whether it's time to panic or not. One departure I am a little worried over, though, is Fury. Now, this is a guy that is not so easy to replace. Off-tank may be a relatively stacked position, but Fury is at the top. He's been one of the most brilliant off-tank players in the league for three years. He is unbelievably consistent, clutch, and flexible. How the Fusion intend to replace him is beyond me. No matter who they get, there is going to be a lot of pressure on that individual to fill in the shoes left behind by Fury. But maybe that's not what the Fusion are looking for. They might not necessarily be searching for somebody who is as gifted. They more so could be searching for that perfect off-tank partner for Mono. Finding someone who synergizes perfectly with him is going to be the key. So you know what? Maybe losing Fury won't be the end of the world either. I will say though, if there is one loss that is worth panicking over, it's probably this one. Like I said, Fury's not going to be so easily replaceable strictly from the impact side of things. 
Listen, Philly fans, I know this is heartbreaking stuff to deal with, but you have to remember that your team is under different coaching now. 9K is trying to build a team in his vision, and that vision happens to be different than the one KDG had. He's looking for players who fit his system, and I think you need to trust in him. If a non-Philly fan like myself is believing in him, then so should you. I get the feeling that Philly might be just fine. They definitely have a plan. Trust in your team. Get upset after we see whether it works or not. Looking at it from the point of view of Sato, Fury, and Ivy, I think it's safe to say that they will all be sought after free agents. Each of them had a spectacular 2020 campaign, and teams will definitely be attracted to them and be willing to spend the big bucks on them as well. They won't have trouble finding a new home, I feel like. The only thing that's uncertain, though, is where they sign, of course. It could just be me, but I think Toronto is actually a reasonable destination for all three of them. For one, they all have experience under a mixed roster already. But two, they all might want to play with KDG still. In terms of some other places where people could go, I think it's reasonable to think Sato might be on his way to Florida now that Fate's gotten traded over to Shanghai. Plus, the main tank market is tough and it's kind of dry, so there's not a lot of options out there for Sato, I feel. Fury has some more options available to him, though. There's the Dynasty, maybe the Justice pick him up. These full Korean teams with a hole at off tank are going to be very interested in him. With Ivy, maybe the Shock could bring him in if they don't feel totally invested in their current DPS. Or what about Florida? Ivy could give them the extra versatility they were lacking in Season 3. Let's see what the future has in store for these three all-stars. Next up is the Guangzhou Charge, who said their goodbyes to Nero, Happy, and of course Shu, who signed with the Gladiators, as we already mentioned. Not gonna lie, this is a pretty sad time to be a Guangzhou fan. Three of your OG members are gone, and I believe all that's left of your Season 2 roster now is Rio, and he might even be on his way out too for all we know. But man, losing those guys is a major blow. I already talked about the impact of Shu before because he's a consistent A tier level flex support, but... I think that Happy and Nero brought their own specific strengths to the team as well, and they're going to be missed. Since joining the league, Happy has always been an elite level sniper, and this year he was much improved consistency-wise. Replacing that is not going to be an easy feat, because Happy is a freak of nature on the Widowmaker, and he's practically unstoppable when he's feeling it. Some teams could really benefit from his talents, like the Toronto Defiant, let's say. That could be a promising destination. No matter where he goes, though, I think said team will be quite pleased with the results. As for Nero, he might still have some value in him as well. It might not be at like Shu or Happy levels of value, but he's still a pretty good Western Flex DPS, and I think that people forget that Nero was playing fairly well this year before he got replaced by Eileen. Nero is by no means washed up, and I think he could make for a good fit on a Western team. Not being so far away from home might put him in a better overall mindset, which could positively affect his play. Some potential destinations I could see him landing at are like Houston, the Valiant, maybe Vancouver or Toronto, good luck to Nero, because I really do want him to find a new team. To finish off the departure list for this episode, the Spark surprisingly parted ways with QOQ. I thought he was a pretty good mid-season pickup for them, so I'm a little surprised by this. I think he has a lot of potential, and he could still unlock said potential, so I'm really hoping a new team in need of an off-tank gives him a chance. He gave the Spark a needed boost mid-season, and there definitely was an upgrade in team play quality, even though the results don't necessarily reflect that. QOQ getting his contract renewed makes me think the Spark are ready to give Gushui what he's always wanted, a Chinese off-tank player. Although Gushui has practiced and improved his Korean a lot, it can only get so good you have to imagine. Being able to properly communicate with someone who will fully understand his callouts could yield some beneficial results. If not, they could theoretically sign like Fury, which would be really nice too. Don't be sad, Spark fans. This might be the start of something amazing. Sadly, we also had a retirement announced this week. Karkar decided to hang it up after almost three years of playing the game at a competitive level. His reasoning behind this decision was that he simply does not enjoy the game anymore. The last few months in particular have not treated him kindly, and he just doesn't like the current state of the game. All of that, in my opinion, is very reasonable, but I'm still disappointed to see him go. I know a lot of people won't care because he had little impact on Vancouver, but Karkar still did have a solid career. Before the Overwatch League, he was part of one of the most dominant teams in the history of North American contenders while playing on Fusion University for a short while. But then some inactivity kind of tanked his Overwatch League value, which really sucks. Karkar is a chill dude though. He's only 18, so he has plenty of time to figure out what will be the next chapter in his life. And I wish him nothing but the best moving forward. To cap off this episode's recap, the London Spitfire made some coaching announcements. Unsurprisingly, one was Commander X out of British Hurricane. Given that this team has literally come in first place in every single event he's been the coach, I would say this is a well-deserved promotion. It further hints that London may be looking to pick up British Hurricane players as well. If not, 
it's still a worthwhile pickup nonetheless given the track record. Also signed was Reprise, who I'm a bit more familiar with actually, as he was once a coach on the Valiant during Season 2. Some of his other coaching experience includes Mayhem Academy, where he spent time with players such as Fact Fiction, in Shacks, and Revival 2, I believe. I like the way the Spitfire have started their rebuild. They have a solid foundation with their coaching staff going, and I can't wait to see who else they sign in the coming weeks. And with that closing thought in mind, that's going to wrap up Episode 6 of the Overwatch League Offseason Recap. Make sure to let me know what you think of all of these moves down in the comment section, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like, and subscribe to the channel if you're new, if you want to stay up to date with all things Overwatch League offseason news related, and to further keep up with all of it, make sure to check out the playlist down in the description below if you want to keep up to date with the series, and you can also further support me by joining my Discord, following me on Twitter, and becoming a channel member. And as always, thanks so much for watching, I really do appreciate your support, and until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.